Hello and welcome to London Broadcast Studios for Fighting Misinformation Online. Hosted by the European University Institute, Kalus School Benkin Foundation, Google and YouTube. Over the course of the next two hours, we will bring together a diverse range of speakers from news organisations, politics, academia and tech companies who are all working to tackle misinformation, plus a live Q&A and breakouts which we want you to get involved with. Amongst our guests, we are delighted to welcome VP Vera Jourova, Vice President of the European Commission. Sundar Pichai, CEO Google and Alphabet. Rasmus Kleist Nielsen, Director Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. Professor Alexander Stubb, Director EUI School of Transnational Governance. And Emily Evans, CEO, The Economist Educational Foundation. But first, I am delighted to welcome Matt Britton, President of Google's business operations in Europe, the Middle East and Africa, to give us his opening remarks. Hello, I'm Matt Britton and I run Google's operations in Africa, Europe and the Middle East. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to this important summit. Now, I first experienced the connected world in a computer lab in Cambridge back in 1989. I was a student and at the time the only people you could connect with were the people in the same room so it was pretty underwhelming to be honest. So I could never have imagined then how the tool in front of me was going to impact society around the world and not least how important it was going to be through a global pandemic. Because over the last 18 months we've all used digital services more than ever before and over half the world is now online our use of technology leapt forward between five and ten years in as many months. And even my parents, who are nearly 90, they moved their social lives, their exercise routines, their shopping and their viewing online. The web's been a lifeline for so many in lockdown. But digital acceleration hasn't been without its challenges, because in a world where anyone can be a publisher and social platforms can scale and spread content to millions of people, well, misinformation is a stubborn problem. Our aim at Google is to give you the information you want, the answers you need, and the accuracy you deserve. Because when you turn to Google search, as millions do every day, it's to access high quality information, to verify things you've heard elsewhere, and to learn more about the world. Or when you want to learn how to do something or explore a topic on YouTube, you want to know that you are better informed. So while we invest hugely in people, in tools, and in processes to deliver on our responsibilities, filtering out disinformation isn't something that we can do alone. We have long worked in collaboration with partners in every country to innovate and to create ways to counteract disinformation and fake news online, covering everything from 5G technology to national security to COVID-19 itself. We know that people are vulnerable to fake news. Earlier this month, researchers at NYU and the University of Grenoble looked at the US election period last year, and they found that news publishers, known for putting out misinformation, got six times the amount of likes, shares, and interactions on social media than trustworthy sources did. So what more are we doing at Google to play our part? Well, as I've said, collaboration is absolutely the key to success in the fight for quality information. For many years, we've invested in products and partnerships to fight misinformation too. Back in 2018, we signed the EU Code of Practice on Disinformation. And now we're working hard with all the other signatories on updating that code to make it more robust, more impactful, and ready to address the current challenges because we're proud of what we've achieved, but we believe we can go further. That's why we're also contributing 25 million euros to launch the European News and Information Fund. It's been set up by the European University Institute and the Kaloust Gulbenkian Foundation, all under the supervision of the European Digital Media Observatory. And it's there to strengthen fact-checking, to improve media literacy, and to invest in research on disinformation. This goes alongside our long-standing investments, like our Google News Initiative, which has provided verification training to more than 90,000 journalists over the past few years. And we've also supported fact-checking initiatives, like Fact and Check Einen Zwanzig, which is a unique partnership with the German press agency, equipping journalists with the tools they needed to debunk German election misinformation. Every day, Google surfaces independent fact checks six million times. They're there to help you spot misinformation online. And we recently launched our 
Safety Engineering Centre for Content Responsibility in Dublin, our regional headquarters. Experts there tackle illegal and harmful content and engage with regulators and other expert organisations to work together on this fight. And for particularly critical topics like COVID, we elevate information from expert sources like local health authorities to make sure it's easy for people to find trusted information. And we develop new features to help you evaluate the credibility of things you read, check the facts and dig deeper. The challenge that we face is significant, but by using reputable research, best practices, and by working together with experts, we're finding new and innovative ways to fight disinformation. We hope today's summit provides even more space for collaboration. You're going to hear from those in government, in media organisations, non-profits, and from academia, sharing their insights and experiences in this field. And we'll also share some of the ways that we at Google and YouTube approach misinformation across our products and policies. We believe more than ever in our mission to make the world's information accessible and useful for everyone. And we know that by working together, we can achieve more progress faster. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for that welcome. As Matt said, collaboration is of utmost importance in the battle against misinformation. And to build on that sentiment, I'm delighted to welcome the European Commission's Vice President, Vera Jourova, who is leading the European Commission's work on values and transparency. It is a great pleasure to be virtually with you for this important event on fighting disinformation online. Digitalization brings new opportunities for our democracies as more and more citizens get their information and engage in the democratic process online. But digitalization has also presented new challenges. Notably, disinformation is prevalent online and it has done particular harm during the coronavirus pandemic. In response to this threat, the EU has made substantial efforts to combat its spread in full respect of our fundamental rights and freedoms. A centerpiece of our efforts has been the self-regulatory code of practice on disinformation. Its signatories include major online platforms active in the EU, as well as major trade associations from the advertising sector. The code was a good first step, but it was not enough to change the landscape in a sufficient way. This is why I want to overhaul it. In May, we published our vision on how it should be reinforced. A stronger code should help reduce financial incentives to disinformation and empower users to be able to control better what they see online. It will promote cooperation with fact-checkers and researchers across EU countries in all official languages. Our aspiration is also that the code of practice should evolve towards a co-regulatory instrument as foreseen in the Digital Services Act. Very large platforms will benefit from participating in the Strengths and Code as it will help them prepare for new requirements applicable to them under the Digital Services Act. Last week was an important meeting with all the signatories and new companies that want to join the Code. And here actions speak louder than words. I want to send a very clear message that this means that if the code should be the practicable way for companies to mitigate the risks posed by disinformation, it must be strong and respect our guidance from May. We will not accept a code that does not live up to this and I hope I can count on Google and other major platforms to drive the efforts to shape a tool that is really effective and ensures a more transparent, safe and trustworthy online environment. This is the moment for the online players to show their commitment in the fight against disinformation. This is the moment for a true milestone rather than hide behind corporate slogans. I expect the first draft this year. At the same time, disinformation is a dynamic phenomenon. This is why we can only address it if we cooperate and take our responsibilities, each and every one of us, in his or her role. 
In general, our plan is not only to use regulatory or co-regulatory measures to address this information. I want to support creating an environment with multiple actors. I want to apply the whole of society approach. This is truly important because when fighting this information, I cannot accept the limitations of free speech. It will be impossible to regulate everything, nor should we try to do so. But to date, the market has failed to take care of the responsible online environment. And it is our obligation as regulators to incentivize the market to do the right thing. This is all the more important as today's democracy is happening increasingly online. And the online companies provide tools for both good and bad actors to influence the public discourse and even a political choice. With this in mind, I will propose this year another piece of legislation to put order in the digital advertising market. We are seeing a trend. Election campaigning is moving online. So do disinformation campaigns. Yet today, almost everything is possible. Using sensitive data, precise and dynamic targeting tools, building so-called look-alike audiences or buying and matching data from different data brokers without any check of where this data came from. Today, people can see a content without knowing why are they seeing it. Has someone paid for it? And if yes, then who? This is why this legislation is needed. Campaigning should not be a competition of dirty methods. And freedom of speech is not the same as freedom to reach or use all the methods available on the market. I want to use this opportunity to appeal to online players to work with us to make this regulation strong and effective, rather than search for ways to dilute it in the process. The time has come to try to fix what's broken in the world of online expression of democracy. You can expect the Commission to be active on many fronts. In our work against disinformation, the Commission is also supporting the European Digital Media Observatory, so-called EDMO, whose consortium is coordinated by the European University Institute. We will continue to back, also financially, the EDMO, which is a unique venture supporting the creation of a cross-border and multidisciplinary community of independent fact-checkers and academic researchers. It is encouraging to see initiatives like the European Media and Information Fund, which will provide grants to researchers, fact-checkers, non-for-profits and other public interest-oriented organizations working on disinformation research and strengthening media literacy and fact-checking. What the purveyors of disinformation do is one thing, but for me it is crucial that we, the citizens, become more aware and remain vigilant to avoid being fooled by disinformation online. And the people must be especially alert to the threats to our democracies and integrity of our elections. This is why we are launching initiatives that will be beneficial in the mid-term perspective. Media literacy for citizens of all ages is one example of such measures to combat disinformation. It can be effective when done properly. The EU will increase funding for media literacy actions under the cross-sectorial strand of the Creative Europe Programme 2021-27. And we will also work with ERGA and other actors to develop support and education programmes. As I just alluded to, we are also very aware that disinformation is fueled in particular through foreign influence operations. As set out in the European Democracy Action Plan, 
We are developing the EU's toolbox for countering foreign interference and consider new instruments that allow imposing costs on the perpetrators of disinformation. The other measures in our action plan go hand in hand with these enhanced steps at countering disinformation online. For example, we will strengthen media freedom and pluralism because by providing the public with reliable information, media play an important role in fighting disinformation and the manipulation of democratic debate. We will empower citizens to make informed decisions. We are making steady progress on many fronts, but we can never be complacent. The success of the action plan depends on a comprehensive response addressing the sources, channels and targets of disinformation and with active involvement of all stakeholders. This event is a great opportunity to support that goal. I am looking forward to your ideas and insights at today's summit. I am confident that they will stimulate our collective efforts in successfully countering disinformation and building more resilient democracies. Thank you, Vice President Jurova, for your important remarks and for outlining the ambition for a whole society approach, which is what brings us all together today. I am delighted to now welcome Chief Executive Officer of Google and Alphabet, Sundar Pichai, to define, to use his own words, why combating misinformation is at the heart of everything we do at Google. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here. Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. Fighting misinformation is a core part of that work. So I want to thank European Commission Vice President Yorava for her leadership on this important issue. There is no question in my mind that the open web has been a powerful force for good. It's radically improved access to information and opportunity. Whether you're looking for information on COVID vaccines, applying for a small business loan, or learning new skills. While we deeply value the free expression the web has provided, we also recognize it can be exploited. There are those who want to do harm by posting toxic, misleading, or false information. Misinformation is a complex challenge, made more so because information itself is constantly evolving. For example, more than 500 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every minute and approximately 15% of Google searches each day we've never seen before. We feel a deep responsibility to keep people, user, our products safe and secure. That's why we invest deeply to deliver high quality information. Whether that's pointing to authoritative information from public health organizations, or giving you context and transparency about your search results. We also remove demote and demonetize low quality content or content that violates our policies. Every day we take down 8 million deceptive ads and we scan 100 billion apps to make sure they are safe. We regularly take action against harmful misinformation. For example, last week, YouTube expanded our medical misinformation policies. Now we'll remove content that makes false claims about the so-called dangers of approved vaccines. And at the same time, we recognize and highlight authoritative, high-quality content. Across all of this work, we strive to have transparent policies and enforce them without regard to politics or point of view. We work closely with experts to stay ahead of emerging threats and develop frameworks for action. Earlier, Matt mentioned our contribution of 25 million euros to the European Media and Information Fund. We are proud to support the European Commission and others to address disinformation by strengthening media literacy and supporting fact-checking. Regulation and industry standards also have important roles to play. Google will be an active partner in those discussions 
working with governments, other companies, and leading universities and NGOs. The only way we build trust is if we build it together. I'm optimistic we can help address harm, improve accountability, and ensure more people can benefit from the opportunities the internet creates. Thank you. Sundar Pichai on the complexities of tackling misinformation and giving us an insight into the approach taken by Google and YouTube. Time now to welcome our keynote speaker, the former Prime Minister of Finland and now Director of the School of Transnational Governance at the European University Institute, Professor Alexander Stubb. It's a great pleasure to speak at the Fighting Misinformation Summit, uh, co-organised by the Gulbenkian Foundation, the European University Institute, Google uh, and YouTube. I think we're probably dealing with one of the key issues that has to do with modern communication, politics, business, security and even democracy because we're very much in a situation that if there is disinformation, if there are alternative truths, it's very difficult to have any form of public discourse and that's why I'm very happy that we've come together with Commissioner Jourova uh, with Google and many others uh, to discuss this extremely important subject. I mean misinformation of course it applies to all of us it doesn't matter if you're a farmer up in Finland or if you are a teacher in Tanzania uh, you can be basically short-handed if the facts are not right and I think during Covid we've seen this in, in a dramatic way in the sense that you know we've had health workers attacked through misinformation we've had actually vaccine providers uh, been attacked and the whole debate about vaccines has been littered uh, with information which is not true and, and not scientific. Um, and of course security is a big part of it as, as well, you know, meddling in elections either coming internally from a country or from the outside or someone inciting say violence in a particular demonstration uh, through misinformation, fake news and even fake videos. So, you know, we're talking about one of the key uh, areas of society today. And, you know, here at the School of Transnational Governance, we have a wonderful patron this year. Her name is Hanna Arendt, and you will know her as one of the greatest post-war and uh, World War uh, freedom fighters. And uh, she had a lovely quote uh, on misinformation and it goes like this, quote, How can you have an opinion if you're not informed? If everybody always lies to you, the consequence is not that you believe the lies, but rather that nobody believes anything any longer. And the people that no longer can believe anything cannot make up its mind. It is deprived not only of its capacity to act, but also of its capacity to think and to judge. And with such a people, you can then do what you please." End of quote. Uh, this is what I mean when I talk about the impossibility of being engaged in public discourse, if not even the basic information and the facts are the same. Now, we know too little about the scale and basically the mechanisms of disinformation. We're trying to understand. And I today have three points, which, and three questions really, which I would like for you to address and, and, and discuss. Number one, what do we actually need in terms of understanding the mechanisms of uh, fake news and misinformation? So we need to understand the scale, we need to understand the techniques, and we need to understand the tools and the impact of those tools. So that means that we need to analyze and detect. And this is of course is where, for instance, academia is very strong. We can do a lot of the research here, for instance, at the European University Institute, and on evidence-based information. Now, there's always talk about social sciences 
um, and relativist that you know can social science provide the answers like natural sciences do well the answer to that is it cannot do it to 100% but even if we get to 95% of the fact or 95% of the truth then we can't anymore be talking about misinformation or uh, disinformation so what we need is serious uh, fact-checking. Second, how do we do it? Well, we believe that this is very much a multi-stakeholder, and sorry for using this word monstrosity, multi-stakeholder endeavor. So this means that you need to have the private sector involved, it means you need to have the public sector involved. And it means taking responsibility. It's the responsibility of the media. It's the responsibility of companies and entrepreneurs. It's the responsibility of NGOs and civil society. Uh, it's the responsibility uh, of academics and professors and researchers to try to suss out essentially what uh, is right and what is wrong, what is true uh, and what is a lie. Therefore, we've created uh, the European Digital Media Observatory with the generous help of uh, the European Commission and Commissioner Jourova. The basic idea is to bring together fact-checkers, people who are experts in media literacy, and people who do academic research uh, in the field. Uh, and we've been working on this and creating this broad hub with uh, seven, well, seven different hubs uh, working on the, on, on the subject, having different pl platforms and, and, and networks. So how do we do it? We have EDMO, the European Digital Media Observatory. Check out the homepage there, please. Now, thirdly and finally, how should you do it? And this is where, you know, we come to asking for, for your help. So a little while back, uh, we were able to create the European Media and Information Fund. This is hosted and administered by the Gulbenkian Foundation. And the first donor uh, to the fund was Google. And many thanks for that. We think it's very important that big tech is involved because without the know-how and knowledge of big tech, we can never rid ourselves uh, of uh, this problem. Now, what does the fund do? The fund provides grants. What do you do? You need to apply for one of these grants. And these grants are basically in four areas. Number one is media literacy. I mean, you need to learn and understand how to read information and the media. You need to be media literate. Number two, we attack online disinformation, of which, of course, uh, there is plenty. Number three, we want research in fact-checking. There are many great institutes and centers who do fact-checking already, but we can be even better. And number four, uh, we want to see some academic research. We're very happy from the side of EDMO and here at the European University Institute and the School of Transnational Governance to basically be involved in this and advise and help. I come back to the point I make, made earlier, this is multi-stakeholder. That's why we need foundations, universities, media houses uh, and big tech uh, involved. So let me finish finally uh, by just a couple of, of final thoughts. I'm a firm believer that the best form of society is based on three pillars. And those pillars are liberal democracy, social market economy, and globalization. I also firmly believe that these three pillars need to be based on a set of truths, or at least basic understandings of who we are and what we do. If we start going down the path of lies, of disinformation, of misinformation. It is impossible to sustain that model of society. Therefore, I think this seminar, this summit, Fighting Misinformation, 
is basically standing at the well of one of the most important subjects that an open, transparent and a free society can have today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Stubb. And for those of you interested in applying for the fund, you can find more information on the new European Media and Information Fund website by following the link on screen now. To set the scene for us about misinformation in the EU, Professor of Political Communication and Director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, Rasmus Kleist Nielsen. It's clear that our societies today face tremendous challenges around misinformation. If we want to fight those problems of misinformation, uh, we need to think about what's effective, what will actually uh, help people be more informed, less misinformed, and what's credible, what will retain and even renew people's trust in the information that they rely on. So these are the themes that I will want to talk to uh, about today, uh, is what research can tell us about uh, how we might fight misinformation in evidence-based ways. First of all, uh, it's clear that we face a complex information disorder. And equally importantly, uh, research documents very clearly that people know this. When we ask in our annual Reuters Institute Digital News Report survey whether people are concerned about whether the news they come across online is real or fake, we see 53% uh, across a range of 20 different EU countries saying that they are worried or very worried about the issue of whether the news they see online is real or fake. There are even higher levels of concern in some other countries around the world, the US, um, Brazil, um, uh, the UK. But it's clear that even in the, uh, in the European Union, there's very high levels of concern uh, amongst the public. Now, of course, the question here is what people mean when they say that they're concerned about fake news uh, online. This is something we've tried to understand through qualitative research with focus groups and interviews with citizens uh, from across the world. And I think it's important here to recognize that the original meaning of the word fake news, satire, the onion and similar genres, is not really the way in which people think about fake news today. The things that come to mind uh, to uh, citizens when we ask them to define what fake news means for them are things like poor journalism, journalism that people see as superficial, inaccurate, sensationalist. It's some form of political propaganda, hyperpartisan content, whether it comes from politicians that people think are lying, or various forms of extreme spin and PR, often from pundits or various talking hats uh, appearing in the media. It's also some forms of advertising, some forms of ads and pop-ups around the web link, some forms of sponsored content. These are also examples that citizens give of what fake news means to them. And perhaps worryingly, it's rarely uh, what we might call false news, false and fabricated uh, information, whether produced for profit or for political uh, purposes, uh, whether by foreign states or others. These are the categories that ordinary citizens use to describe to us what they mean by fake news. And what's important here is that people don't see a clear a binary between real news and fake news. And many of the forms uh, of fake news that people say they're most worried about are in part about what they see as mainstream established institutions, including politicians, including publishers, including platforms, falling short of what people expect of them, and also a recognition from the public that misinformation and fake news is often intrinsically political, in part about the big questions of how we live together, who gets what, when, and how, um, and who we are in our societies. So, if we think about this, not just in terms of the problems that people say that they face, but also who they see as responsible for them, research documents that it's clear the public sees politicians, platform companies, and to some extent, though less so, publishers, as being at the heart of information disorder problems. First of all, when we ask in our survey research um, who people are most concerned about false and misleading information from, uh, this is specifically around uh, the coronavirus, uh, the plurality uh, in the countries that we cover in our survey research uh, say they're most concerned about the behavior of domestic politicians. It can be their own government, it can be individual politicians, it can be political parties that uh, citizens have reservations about and believe are sometimes uh, engaging in spreading false and misleading information, for example, about coronavirus. It can also be fellow citizens. Uh, a large number of people say that they're most concerned about the behavior of ordinary people. This is sort of the proverbial uncle sharing misleading things on a social media platform. Or for that matter, activists uh, who are uh, motivated by their own genuine belief in what they're advancing, but sometimes seen uh, skeptically by other citizens um, who, who may be concerned about the strategies and tactics that they use. 
Importantly, of course, we also need to recognize that a significant minority of the public uh, see journalists and media organizations as, from their point of view, the most concerning sources of false and misleading information, even around the coronavirus. If we turn then from sources to platforms of misinformation um, and ask people again what platforms for online misinformation, specifically around COVID, they're most concerned about, a plurality uh, identifies Facebook as the largest social media platform in most of the countries that we survey, 28%. 15% identify different messaging applications, some of them, of course, in turn owned by Facebook as well. Uh, many also express concern about search. Effectively, in many markets, this means primarily Google. They express concern about YouTube, and they express concern about Twitter, a much smaller, but in some ways, politically perhaps quite important network um, that a significant minority say that they see as the most concerning platform for false or misleading information. So the public see politicians, platforms, and to a lesser extent publishers as part and parcel of the information disorder that we face. So in that light, it's not really surprising that when a few years ago we asked people who they expect to act against these problems, uh, who should make it easier for citizens to separate what's real and fake on the internet, that there is very large public support for all these different kinds of actors to get involved. 75% said back in 2018 that they feel publishers should do more to help citizens discern what's real and what's fake online. 71% say that they believe platforms should do more. And 61% uh, say they believe that governments should do more, uh, with uh, quite a lot of success, uh, support for this in Europe in particular, and much less support for this, I should note, in the United States, where, of course, uh, a very different uh, First Amendment tradition leads to greater skepticism of governments taking a more active role um, in the space of free expression. But if citizens expect us all, publishers, platforms, policymakers, to engage in addressing information disorder uh, and want us to do this in a way where they can have confidence that they do this in the citizenry interest and not from their own self-interest, uh, whether from politicians, platforms, or publishers alone. If that is about the credibility side of this, what can research tell us about the efficacy side of this, the effectiveness side of this, about what will actually make a difference in terms of how uh, we can fight misinformation problems? I'll start with one uh, central finding that I think sometimes gets lost in these conversations where we can sometimes uh, be so uh, struck by the novel problems that we face that we can forget some of the more timeless insights we already have from decades of research. And that is the simple point that journalism matters. Um, we know from decades of research that using news is associated with being more informed and hence more resilient in the face of misinformation, less likely to be led astray by untrustworthy uh, or false or misleading information. We know this from studies of politics, that people who use uh, news uh, more uh, frequently are more informed uh, about politics. We know it about coronavirus as a disease, uh, where people who follow the news more closely are significantly more uh, informed about coronavirus as a disease. We know it about vaccines, that people who rely on news organizations as a source of information about coronavirus uh, are significantly less likely to hold false beliefs about vaccines uh, in the countries where we have research. We also know, and I think this is important to keep in mind as well, that even in the United States, where arguably we had particularly severe information disorder problems, news remain a far larger part of media use than identified fake news, even on social media. And misinformation consumption and sharing of misinformation is highly concentrated, often in small minorities of very partisan activists who are actively spreading things, sometimes knowing that they're false, because they believe that they advance ends in which these citizens believe. So for example, one study by Jennifer Allen and colleagues found that news consumption uh, compromise almost 15% of Americans' daily media diet, whereas fake news compromise uh, well under 1%, in fact, only 0.15% of Americans' daily media diet. And even on social media, where, of course, we have problems sometimes accessing data to study the larger platforms, YouTube, Facebook, and some of the others, on Twitter, one team of uh, researchers found that fake news accounted for nearly 6%, so much more than uh, in media diet overall, but was heavily concentrated, with just 1% of users exposed to 80% of the fake news, and just 0.1% of users responsible for sharing 80% uh, of the fake news. This is really important. 
to recognize that news consumption seemed to outweigh exposure to fake news by a factor of about 100 for the average person, at least in the United States, where we have research on this. News is not perfect. Um, but years of research uh, has consistently shown that news use is associated with being more informed about public affairs, more active in political processes, more engaged in local communities. Mm -hmm. That is why it's so important we recognize and address growing problems of information inequality and ensure that people are resilient, robust, and informed in the face of the misinformation that they, of course, sometimes come across. Secondly, in addition to the importance of journalism, there are many specific tactical interventions like fact-checking that can also help. Um, now, fact-checking, to take that example, can help in many different ways. It can have a disciplining effect on political elites to know that professional fact-checkers will check what they say and, uh, and publicly name and shame them uh, if they engage in misrepresentations or outright lies. It can uh, help technology companies make ranking decisions and limit the reach and distribution and sharing of false and misleading information, but it can also help uh, individual citizens assess the veracity of information and whether they themselves might be likely to share it. I'll show just a, a single example of this from a study we've done because so much work is done in the US. We've done a piece of work uh, supported by the Trusted News Initiative testing, for example, whether the adding of false or partly false labels uh, on a social media platform will lead people to see items identified as false and misleading by independent fact checkers as less accurate. Two things to note here. First is that the perceived accuracy of these claims is very low in the first place uh, towards the bottom of the scale. And secondly, that in some uh, countries, we find experimental results showing a significant effect of some countries. These are small effects, but of course, they add up on very large platforms if deployed at scale. And it's not only about the perceived accuracy of the claims uh, that we have labeled in this experiment, it's also about people's self-reported propensity to share these things. Uh, as uh, with the perceived accuracy, we find that adding labels show a significant effect in some countries, but not all. This, of course, also stressed the importance of research so that we don't assume we have sort of one-size-fits-all solutions that will work under all conditions and in all countries. There are some solutions that work in some countries, but we need research to ensure that we actually do things that have a likelihood of working out. So, where can we go next if we want to fight misinformation in evidence-based ways? Uh, this is where I'll end. I think we need to recognize, first of all, that the public is concerned about information disorder and, importantly, like researchers, see politicians, platforms very much, uh, but also, to a lesser extent, publishers at the heart of the information disorders that we face. The complexity uh, and irreducibly political nature of this disorder and the public's recognition of this complexity and irreducibly political nature of this disorder means that simplistic direct solutions risk backfiring because they'll alienate people who see them as not addressing the problems that they are concerned about or they see them as self-interested attempts by some actors to control public discourse, uh, often in areas that are of high political significance and indeed involve governments themselves. But of course, Everyone can and should act in different ways against information disorder. And the public, as our research shows, expects everyone to act. There is much to be done. Publishers, for example, can help build resilience by providing trustworthy news to a wide audience uh, and avoid inadvertently amplifying misinformation. Platforms, for example, can clarify their community standards, ensure clear, consistent enforcement with due process, invest in trustworthy information, fact-checking, and the like, and provide data access so we can better understand the nature of the problems that we face and what responses might uh, be effective. And finally, of course, policymakers have a role here. They can, for example, support independent journalism, support independent fact-checking and research, invest in oversight and accountability, and ensure greater transparency. Now, researchers, I think, have a role as well. Uh, it's up to citizens and their elected representatives to make the collectively binding decisions but if we want responses that do not only feel good and look good, um, but are actually credible and effective, we need to understand the scale and scope of the problems that we face. We need to understand how the public thinks about these problems so that we can respond in ways that will resonate and address the concerns that people actually have. And we need to have independent evidence-based research to guide those decisions so that we don't end up fighting one of the defining problems of our time in a way that is not, in fact, based on evidence. Thank you very much. Da sehen wir ganz eindeutig, dass jetzt im Jahr auch 2021 Dinge wie Faktencheck und die Bekämpfung und Desinformation eigentlich nur in Teamarbeit funktionieren. Mein Name ist Stefan Voss. 
Ich arbeite seit über 20 Jahren bei der deutschen Presseagentur dpa und ich habe mit Kollegen zusammen das Projekt Faktencheck 21 vor gut einem Jahr gestartet mit dem Ziel, mehr Faktenchecker in Deutschland zu fördern. Faktencheck 21 ist ein Schulungsprojekt für deutsche Medienhäuser. Wir haben in der Corona-Pandemie gesehen, wie unfassbar groß die Kampagnen der Lügen, der Täuschungen sind und haben uns dann auch gesagt, was passiert in der Bundestagswahl. Das war der konkrete Aufhänger für uns, zu erkennen, wir müssen etwas dagegen tun. Und wir sehen ganz klar, dass Verifikation nicht von, auch von einzelnen Journalisten betrieben werden kann. Denn manche Fakes sind auch sehr kompliziert und es kommt darauf an, dass man sich austauscht und sein Wissen weitergibt. Wir machen zwei Tage ganz intensive digitale Rechercheschulung. Wir versammeln dort immer maximal 15 Kolleginnen und Kollegen von ganz verschiedenen Medien, virtuell, also als Videokonferenz. Plötzlich merken die, dass man auch zwischen dem Schwarzwald und Hamburg auch äh, zusammenarbeiten kann, um gemeinsam einen Fall zu lösen. Und das hat eine enorme Dynamik für uns auch. Die, die beim Workshop bei uns waren, fangen plötzlich an und trainieren ihre Kolleginnen und Kollegen. Und das ist absolut erwünscht von uns. Wir wollen, dass nachhaltig mehr Faktenchecker haben. Und das geht eben nur durch eine intensive, dauerhafte Betreuung. We'll be hearing from Stefan later this morning and he will also be joining us for a live Q&A session. So please don't forget to send us your questions using these icons. Our next guest speaker, a trained journalist, understands that fighting the spread of misinformation must not only involve a technological response, but must also involve active citizen collaboration. Please welcome Clara Jimenez-Cruz, co-founder and head of Maldita.es. Hello, my name is Clara Jimenez-Cruz and I'm the CEO of a fact-checking organization based in Madrid, Maldita.es. We are a non-profit fact-checking organization in the form of a foundation. We fight misinformation in Spanish, in all the Spanish-speaking countries, and we follow a bottom-up strategy. We ask citizens which are their concerns, what preoccupies them, and then we try to give them answers to those. That's why we consider ourselves a public service for citizens. Why do we do this the way we do it? Why do we fight misinformation, asking citizens what is affecting them and then going up? Because when we started in the fact-checking business, we realized pretty soon that there were two different levels of conversation. One in which journalists, politicians, and informed citizens were talking about current events with fact-checked information in their hands, and then the rest of the conversation. The conversation that those people who, who work 12 hours a day and get home very tired and don't feel like turning on the news we're having. They were having conversations with bad data, bad information, and about issues that might not even have occurred. We realized we needed to listen to those conversations in order to know and understand what we needed to fact check. But that meant two things. One, listening to them, which is not always so easy, and two, choose where to listen. How did we manage to do that? Well, in Spain, we turned to the digital news report from the Reuters Institute. We started four years ago, but it still applies now. And we realized that in Spain, most citizens were consuming information and therefore also misinformation through certain social media. 39% in Facebook, 35% in WhatsApp, 21% in YouTube. If you ask, for example, United Kingdom colleagues, they will probably not have the same data or the same perception of disinformation running through social media as we do, because in general, in peripheric languages and countries in the global south, we tend to consume information on closed messaging apps and on social media much more than on regular media sites. Taking this into account, having this in mind, we had to make a decision on how we were going to address those citizens. How were we gonna interact with, with them and how we were gonna deliver fact-checked information. And that, in Maldita's case, meant three things. Format, topic, and tone. If we were going to attend the rest of the conversation, if we wanted to talk to the people 
that actually needed fact check information the most, that meant that we needed to adapt to them and not the other way around. People that don't consume media on a general basis were probably not up to reading a 2000 word article to find out that something is wrong. But they were consuming a lot of misinformation in these kind of formats, in memes, in videos, in comics, in images. So we decided to copy the bad guys and start doing the same thing. We decided to start fact checking and debunking and doing quality journalism in not so regular or not so usual formats like memes, like comics, like images or funny videos. We change our tone. We sometimes change our topic because the things that preoccupy the most that pe those people in the rest of the conversation might not be the same ones as the one in the uppercase. And we needed to change the way we were communicating. We also needed to adapt to those social media in which people were consuming. We soon realized that Maldita being a thriving fact-checking organization, but still a very small and fragile one, was not good enough to be able to reach all the Spanish speakers around the world that were consuming misinformation. So we decided that collaboration had to be our strategy to get fact-checking as far as we could. And that meant collaborating with very different actors in a problem such as disinformation. For example, collaborating with citizens. In the global south in which consumption through closed messaging apps is much higher than in other um, countries, we realized very soon that we needed those citizens, our users, what we call malditas and malditos, to be the ones that were reporting misinformation so that we could know what people were consuming and be able to debunk it. We collaborate with citizens when they report misinformation for us to fact check. When they share the fact checked information to those other users on closed platforms and in a third way, which is much more peculiar and unique for Maldita. Our Malditas and Malditos, our users, our citizens contribute with their expertise. And that contribution looks a bit like this. Today, 2,500 malditos and malditas contribute with their expertise, uh, with our fact check and our debunkings. And here are some examples. Juan and Guido, who are two doctors that know a lot about medicine, are also very, very good comic drawers. And they needed someone to tell them which were the questions people were asking themselves. We put the questions, they put the comics. And that, therefore, we can deliver a different format to our audience that has been contributed by them. Gemma del Caño is an expert in food industry and she comes to our office from time to time to record videos with us in which she explains, in this case, what the logs on the different packaging say that it's not real. Or Eduardo Malmierca, who is a doctor and sometimes solves questions about medicine for us and even records his own videos at home. These are different ways of collaborating with your audience. It's not an easy path, but it's very, very enriching. But this is not the only collaboration we soon realized we needed because we needed to go beyond our own audiences. And that meant collaborating with other media companies. There you see that we do a lot of collaboration with different radio stations, both at national and local level. We, co we collaborate with the national TV station, the public TV station in Spain. And we also collaborate with a news agency called Servimedia and with El Diario.es, which is a digital news outlet here in Spain. But again, this might still be audiences that regularly consume uh, news and media information. So we needed to go even further. And before going there, we also needed to collaborate with other fact checkers because one thing that has been realized by all of us with the pandemic is that we find the same kind of misinformation all around the, the globe, even if we belong to different countries. That's why, and these are all collaborations in which Google has taken part, we partner up with Latam Chequea, with all the South American fact checkers, the Coronavirus Fact Alliance that I'm sure most of you know, or the Infodemic COVID-19 uh, Europe Alliance, which were five fact checkers around Europe, sharing um, inputs and sharing debunkings of the misinformation we were seeing around the pandemic in the continent. 
Please, if you don't know that project, go check covidinfodemigeurope.com. I was saying that if we wanted to go beyond our audiences, that means that we need to collaborate with other entities that may attract different audiences from the ones that are already consuming fact-checking. And that's why, for example, we work with FAD and Pantallas Amigas, which are two institutions here in Spain that work with youngsters in different areas, but one of them is fighting hate speech and misinformation. We work with universities like Universidad Rey Juan Carlos, with, with, with whom we have a master's degree, or Universidad de Navarra, with whom we run a disinformation observatory granted by the European Union to try to know better the ecosystem of disinformation here in Spain, or with other organizations like NGO, Oxfam, Ayuda en Acción, Ashoka, etc. Because all this brings us to new audiences and new people that might not know fact-checking but need to engage with fact-checking. And last but not least, and I know many might be sitting here, we collaborate with platforms. There are different levels of collaborating with platforms. You can see them listed there. We don't collaborate with all platforms, and that's something I'm sure we can talk about in the Q&A afterwards. But there is uh, some time of collaboration with some of them. We would like there to be more. We believe that this is a polyedric problem, and that means that we need to go farther. Collaboration is like transparency. It's a word that it's too broad and that needs to be much more specific when we try to talk about it. Meaningful collaboration is a very different thing to regular collaboration. And I think all the actors involved, from governments to fact checkers to media to platforms, need to see to which point their involvement is being made. I'll set up an example and we can talk more about this afterwards. Platforms need to grant data because otherwise fact checkers, researchers, governments go blind-eyed when they try to analyze the problem. The same thing happens with moderation. If we don't all agree on moderation terms and the decision is being made in an office in California, we might have a problem on how sustainable that system is for democracies. I'll leave it here. Thank you for listening. As Clara mentioned, she will be joining our Q&A shortly, so please upvote your questions using this button in the Q&A section. Now, we've heard throughout the course of the morning that fighting misinformation is a complex task and we need to help citizens navigate through this. To discuss further, please welcome the CEO of the Economist Educational Foundation, Emily Evans. Emily, welcome. Thank you. What is the Economist Educational Foundation and why should our audience care about it? So, the Economist Foundation is an independent charity that I set up from inside the Economist newspaper in 2012. And what we do is we enable young people to join really inspiring discussions about the news, which teach them to think critically, communicate effectively, and understand what's happening in the world. And the reason we do that is because those are really important competencies for a young person to thrive throughout their lives. So it sets them up to succeed in, in school and in future work and also obviously as citizens. Um, but for, for an audience with expertise in misinformation, I want to make a really passionate case that those are the competencies that are required for media literacy. Um, and media literacy, obviously, we should all care about that. I'm really glad that the theme of the event today is collaboration because tackling misinformation will take all of us. The policy solutions and the technical solutions have to go hand in hand with the education solutions. So, Emily, my next question to you then is how do you define media literacy? So, to say the obvious things, it obviously has to include some knowledge about the media and reliable information sources. Um, it has to include critical thinking skills to question information. I think we're all going to agree on that. But I think there are a couple of really important media literacy competencies that often get overlooked. So, one is we have to give young people really in-depth knowledge about what's happening in the news because it is almost impossible to be able to tell whether a piece of information is true if you have no context information about it. So vaccines are a really good example. It's really difficult to know if you're looking at a bit of vaccine misinformation if you don't have any background knowledge about vaccination. So knowledge about what's happening in the news 
and then also communication skills. So we teach young people to uh, have open-minded conversations with people who see things differently or uh, be open to ideas that maybe they don't like, um, civil conversations with people who have different points of view. And that is really important because if you don't have those skills, you're not open to receiving the facts because we want to believe misinformation that confirms the things that we already have in our minds, that confirms our current opinions. So yeah, be, being open-minded is a really important element of media literacy and it's a really important element of tackling misinformation. Through your work, what have you learned about what's effective when it comes to building young people's media literacy? So what we do um, is we give teachers resources and training to have great conversations about the news in their classrooms. And then we also have a website where young people from different communities and different countries come together to have conversations with each other and also leading topic experts. So, for example, um, our current topic is COP26 and one of our experts is Al Gore. Um, so, and then those discussions are facilitated by experienced teachers and they can give the kids stars when they see good thinking skills or good communication skills. So um, I guess what we've learned is that really great conversations about the news are a massively powerful way to develop young people's news literacy. And we know that that model works because young people in our program make five times more progress in critical thinking skills and communication skills compared to their peers. Um, but we, we have to be careful that they have certain elements in these conversations. So they have to be expert informed. Um, they have to expose young people to different perspectives. So the kids on our site are from Pakistan and Bangladesh and Palestine and Spain and Italy and Germany. So really different experiences that they're um, exchanging with each other. And the conversations have to be student led. So um, in our program, the teachers are facilitators, they're not lecturers. So the kids are really thinking for themselves and they're being presented with juicy questions and they're sort of supported to explain and reason and justify their answers. So again, kind of um, prompting them and supporting them to think critically, but also to communicate and um, be, be open to ideas that might be true, but might be different to what they've thought about before. The challenge then is delivering uh, young people's media literacy uh, training at scale. How do you do that? Yeah. So if you want to have an impact on young people's education at scale, it makes sense to look at schools, at formal education systems. But a big challenge there is that teachers want to talk to kids about the news. They, they want to focus on media literacy. But in a lot of education systems, there is huge, huge pressure to focus on uh, what gets tested and core academic subjects. So cross-curricular things like this get squeezed out. But what I would say is that if we are really serious about giving young people the media literacy skills that they need so that the next generation can have cohesive communities and healthy democracies, then we have to face up to that challenge and we have to be really ambitious about tackling it. So um, what I would say is, well, what we're going to do is we are going to be really bold in our ambitions to scale up our programme. So we want to be in one in five state schools and thousands of schools globally in the next three years. And what I would implore other people to do, anybody who can, is to make sure that young people are having really good, high quality discussions about the news in schools. Um, because as I say, we, we know that that works. Ambitious goals, we hope you achieve them. Thank you so much for your time, Emily. Thank you for having me. Earlier this week, I had the opportunity to speak with YouTube's Chief Product Officer, Neil Mohan, and Vice Chair of the European Regulators Group for Audiovisual Media Services, Karim Ibruki, to discuss YouTube's approach to misinformation. Neil, in a recent blog post, you wrote that it's not just what YouTube takes down, but how you treat all the content they leave up that gives us the best path forward. Now, is that not in contradiction with policymakers' call to remove harmful disinformation? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and what I was alluding to in that, uh, in that uh, post that I wrote was that it's important to have a very comprehensive approach to misinformation or, or any other type of uh, uh, controversial or, or problematic content on our platform. And we have precisely that. Uh, fighting misinformation, the spread of misinformation is a top priority for me, for all of us at YouTube. And uh, therefore we do take a comprehensive uh, approach. And a lot of what gets written about and talked about 
uh, is the first pillar of our approach, which is removing violative content as quickly as possible. And we do remove millions of videos a quarter. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, for example, we re we've removed on the order of a million videos that were spreading misinformation about the virus, uh, therapeutics, vaccines, et cetera. And we will continue to do so. But what I was alluding to in that quote that you mentioned is that our approach doesn't stop there. We also uh, think a lot about the content that remains on the platform, not just what we remove. So for example, when users are looking for information about um, say elections or a fast breaking news event or uh, information about the pandemic, we raise up content that comes from authoritative channels, uh, channels that might be run by uh, national health authorities or uh, publications that focus on health so that uh, users and their families are getting the most relevant, most useful, accurate information to protect them from the pandemic. We also endeavor to reduce recommendations of content that might not be quite policy violative and therefore removed from the platform uh, uh, so that um, that type of borderline content is not getting re recommended inadvertently as well. And so our approach is a holistic approach, not just about the content that we remove. And that's what we're gonna continue to do so. Uh, an example of that uh, is that COVID-19 information shelf that you all have, we've all seen that runs as soon as you open up the YouTube app, it's been running now for a year and a half. It's got billions and billions of impressions so that users get the most up-to-date, accurate information about the pandemic. Uh, as we live our lives through it and the world starts to emerge from it. Kareem, what's your response to that? And also, what's Erga's view on the balance between removing disinformation on the one hand and raising visibility of authoritative sources? Well, uh, Tina, uh, Erga views are very clear. The fight against disinformation is of the highest importance uh, for our democracy. Freedom of speech must be respected and, and promoted whenever it can, while uh, the deliberative spread of, of uh, false information must be prevented. The danger of disinformation is more graspable than ever in our society, but we also must protect fundamental rights. As you can imagine, the preservation of this balance is quite hard, and, and surely raising visibility for an authoritative source is key in tackling uh, misinformation uh, online. I would add uh, that one must not forget that there is also a third party involved in this debate. You, Tina, as a journalist, uh, independent, and I underline the word independent, news organization, must have unrestricted access to platforms and their content cannot be vetted in any form by those, by those platforms. In this respect, national regulatory authorities must, uh, of course, play a key role because they are and will continue being the cornerstone uh, for the protection of freedom uh, of expression, the promotion of media pluralism and uh, respect of fundamental rights. At European level, uh, discussion, as you know, are ongoing uh, regarding the Digital Service Act. And following the publication of this legislative proposal on the 15th of December 2020, the ERGA uh, members stressed that the terms and conditions of online platform, as well as identification and the supervision of systemic risks, meaning the risks related to the use of platforms affecting the protection of fundamental rights, such as freedom of expression and information, shall involve competent independent regulatory uh, authorities. Our opinion is that decisions cannot be left to online platforms only. OK. Um, Neil, is being responsible ultimately good for business? And what is the role of regulators in providing oversight on, on how the industry is regulating itself? Uh, I would say um, unequivocally, um, being a responsible platform, which as I said, is, is my top priority, YouTube's top priority, uh, is not just something that's important for all of our viewers, all of our creators all over the world. Uh, it is fundamentally good for our business. Uh, you know, for example, uh, one of the, the first thing that I would say there is uh, a core part of YouTube is the creative economy. All the millions of creators all over the world that are producing amazing content, entertainment, information, sharing their ideas with the world. Uh, and it's important for them to be able to earn a sustainable living on our platform. And so we've been working very hard 
uh, to protect our users and creators, of course, but also working very closely with our, our advertising partners, brands uh, who uh, connect with their consumers, with their customers on YouTube on a daily basis. And this has been a multi-year journey. We've worked very closely with them uh, to make sure that uh, content uh, that they're running their ads on on YouTube are brand safe. In fact, we're the first platform to receive uh, um, the Media Rating Council um, certification. Uh, over 99% of content on our platform has been deemed to be brand safe. And so it is very uh, important uh, for our business to be uh, a responsible global platform. The other thing that I'll say, and just picking up on what Karim was saying earlier, uh, we, um, we welcome partnering very closely with... Uh, uh, with ERGA, and uh, we, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with uh, the mission of protecting users uh, all over the world from misinformation. Uh, that's a concerted effort of ours as a platform. We will work uh, in a co-regulatory fashion with, with all of our uh, government and regulatory partners. That's a top priority of mine. And one of the things that I'll just say there uh, um, that I think will make this um, a truly uh, a powerful partnership and something that uh, will be, be beneficial to our users is the single market approach, uh, the country of origin principles, uh, similar to the way uh, that Europe has approached uh, regulations like GD, uh, uh, GRP, et cetera, in the past, ABMS. Uh, if that same sort of set principles applies here, then we can take a holistic approach to addressing this challenge across our platform all across the continent, as opposed to something that's siloed uh, country by country. And so I think that's an important uh, principle to keep in mind as we approach this uh, as a platform, as well as as a business. Kareem, is that a view you share? Well, uh, going back on what, just, uh, on what Neil said, uh, according to me, being irresponsible is not a, a question of being good for business or not. It's a question of moral responsibility and uh, of respect of the core democratic values we share. If it's good for business, then it will be a, a good byproduct, even though, uh, like Neil, I, I think that uh, it will ultimately be good for business. Uh, regarding, for example, the, the code of practice on disinformation, uh, ERGA adopted a report last year in which it conveys the results of, a, uh, of an in-depth monitoring of the implementation of the code. The monitoring was based on, on information provided by the code's signatories and on data that could be collected from also relevant third parties, such as civil society, consumer associations, journalists, academics, researchers, and fact checkers. And we at ERGA agreed that the code is an important step to tackle online disinformation as it has contributed to build a, a new relationship between its signatories, platforms, uh, the EU and uh, the NRAs, the National Audiovisual Regulators. So some platforms have been uh, have made clear efforts, and I want to, to, to really thank them to comply with, with its measures. Nevertheless, we still think at, uh, at ERGA that uh, there is room for improvement. And uh, for example, we, we would need and uh, we would uh, welcome greater transparency, including uh, more detailed data about uh, how the signatories are implementing the code. Uh, for us, it lacks uh, a mechanism through which the information for the self-reports can be independently verified. So we, we would like really to uh, have the platforms making more data available for not only researchers, but also monitoring tools and also country-specific information because uh, 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 as I usually say, you know, global platforms, but local harm. You know, if uh, someone is uh, attacking me on a platform on, or spreading disinformation or misinformation about me, uh, I guess that my colleague in, in, in Germany or in Ireland uh, are not very much affected, but I will be. So, uh, of course, we uh, support the principle of, of country of origin, but also we must take care that uh, there is a response to local problems that uh, uh, arise regarding uh, uh, disinformation or misinformation. So th there has to be a balance uh, between those, 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 those principles. And I also very much welcome what Neil just said about a co-regulatory approach to, uh, to, to those problems. And I really think that, you know, uh, as you usually say, we, we don't have the same uh, ultimate 
goal as a, as a private, uh, you know, uh, as a private company, uh, the ultimate goal is, of course, uh, being su successful and making profit. As a, uh, a regulatory uh, body, our role is to make sure that the core values that we have uh, uh, decided for ourselves are respected uh, in in a much similar way across uh, across Europe. So. To conclude then, Neil, how can EU regulators like Erga members and online platforms like YouTube work together to fight disinformation? Is this really a multi-stakeholder effort? Uh, yes, I think it is. Uh, I think Kareem uh, made a number of good points there, and, I, and I, um, I'm glad that he mentioned the, uh, uh, the code of practice on disinformation. That's an area where, of course, Erga has played a leading role, but it's also an area where we've invested very heavily to live up to our commitments under that code uh, in a way, uh, to Karim's point, which is really about uh, protecting our viewers and our creators. That is the fundamental objective of our focus on responsibility as a global platform. Uh, and as I said earlier, the business benefits of that sort of flow from there. But the goal, of course, is to uh, protect our ecosystem, protect our, our, our viewers from harm that might come from uh, misinformation. Uh, I also wholeheartedly agree uh, on uh, uh, transparency. Uh, we've been publishing a transparency report on a quarterly basis now for some time. We're adding newer and newer metrics to that report, including the viable view rate, which is kind of a, a North Star canonical metric that we use to measure how effectively we're doing as a platform in that regard. It's how we hold ourselves accountable. Uh, and we're going to continue to do more on that front. Uh, uh, as an example, uh, we have third parties that are looking at how uh, misinformation is handled on our platform on a regular basis. Algorithm Watch in Germany uh, recently did an analysis and they most recently, just a few days ago, released their first set of results where they showed that when users were looking for information around the recently concluded German elections, uh, they received information from authoritative news channels uh, first and foremost so that they were getting accurate, relevant, timely information about that. Uh, and uh, they didn't find any evidence on our platform where our recommendations were leading viewers to more extremist content. So that was uh, very reassuring to see uh, in the interest of transparency and third parties taking a look for themselves in terms of how our platform works. Uh, one of the other areas uh, that we're very focused on in terms of partnership uh, is uh, contributing our resources. And so, for example, uh, we recently announced a 25 million euro contribution to the uh, uh, European Media and Information Fund. Uh, that is a fund that will be used to support academics, publishers, nonprofits who can apply for access to those funds. Uh, they can do that uh, for efforts focused on media literacy. They can do that focused on efforts around fact checking. It builds upon our investment in the areas of fact checking and media literacy in the past. And we're going to continue to do things like that. And so those are those are a couple of examples of how uh, we would partner with uh, with regulatory bodies like ERGA, uh, who are leading the way in terms of the fight against misinformation. And same question and final thoughts from you, Kareem, on regulators and online platforms working together to fight disinformation. Yeah, well, of course, it's a multi-stakeholder effort. Look, I would doubt, and uh, maybe uh, Neil, I hope Neil will, will agree with Matt, that, that, that I, I doubt that the creators of the most successful platforms 20 or 25 years ago, ever thought that their brainchild would become such a huge success and be so pivotal in our everyday life. So we are learning as we walk, and uh, uh, we should walk together, surely. But bearing in mind, as I said, that business organization, business is, at the end of the day, creating values, and that value, sorry, and that NRA's mission is to protect a set of values that have been democratically chosen by, by the citizens. So I think there is room for improvement. I, I really welcome the uh, the initiative that, that that they've been put forward by by Neil. But and you know, and I'm uh, to to end on, on a slightly uh, more maybe f funny note that I'm really glad to have this uh, conversation with you, because last time as a regulator, the last time that I wrote to to uh, to, to Google to have some information about the implementation of AVMS in Belgium, I received a, a letter. Uh, signed by Google Ireland, so with no name on it, just Google Ireland. So I'm, I'm really, 
glad that I see that there are actual people behind it and that we can share some of the, uh, that we have, of course, some common objectives. And I'm really looking forward to, to uh, as I said, to uh, work in, uh, uh, in close cooperation with the various uh, uh, platform in uh, enhancing the, uh, the, the, the way we can work together, in achieving, uh, I guess, that uh, uh, the, the goal and the values we share together. Kareem, Neil, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you both. It's really important that we protect the integrity of news. Misinformation can really hurt communities. It can hurt democracy. It can hurt our lives. Full Fact tries to give people the information that they need to be able to make choices for themselves based on the best available information and not just half of the story. We check claims all the way from ones made by politicians in Parliament to people on the internet going viral. The role that partnerships have in combating misinformation is huge. Fact checkers are kind of like the first responders onto an information incident. And in the same way that a paramedic hands over to a doctor when they reach the hospital, fact checkers hand over to health organizations or governments or whoever it is that needs to fill that information gap. With all the will in the world, we can't fact check everything. We're, believe it or not, only 35 people. And we know that if we want to do more, we're going to have to get smarter about how we work. Previously, we used to all flick through newspapers and go on to different websites and pull out the claims that we thought were important. Now we have a system that actually scans through millions of sentences that are published each day. And then it brings the millions down to thousands of claims. That gives us a level of specificity that we couldn't have otherwise. The response from the public has been incredible and finding an answer to the, exactly the question that you have feels like a very powerful thing. And what matters most to us is the long game. Misinformation isn't gonna go away. I'm personally interested in the work that we're going to be doing with specific communities because there are some communities that are hurt more than others by misinformation and how can we empower them actually to go out and do the fact checking, going the extra step and empowering other people to do more for themselves. That's what I'm excited about. Our next speaker for the German press agency DPA is Stefan Voss. Now, DPA wrote its first fact checks in 2013 and established a news verification system in 2017. Today, he'll discuss how collaboration enabled a healthy German election. As you may have noticed, Germany elected a new Bundestag a few days ago. Actually, this is a completely normal event. We do it every four years. But the elections in 2021 were a special challenge for several reasons. It was completely unclear what effect the departure of Angela Merkel after 16 years in power would have on political circumstances in Germany. Moreover, for the first time in German history, the Green Party was ahead in the polls for several weeks. They had the realistic hope that the next chancellor would come from their ranks. The Green Party, a party that had made the fight against climate change and the integration of migrants the focal points of its election campaign. But let's look back one year. In 2020, Germany experienced a phase of disinformation of unknown proportions. The pandemic has shown the astonishing degree to which the lies and fallacies of the corona deniers have found their way into the mainstream of society. The fact-checking team at DPA has been concerned for a long time now that disinformation campaign could have a negative effect on the federal elections. That is why we have been thinking about how we in Germany can counter the danger of disinformation. We are the biggest news agency in our country, but we need many, many allies for this fight. What is the most effective format to refute disinformation? It's fact checks. However, just a year ago, there were less than half a dozen media houses in the whole Germany and the whole of Germany that regularly published fact checks. Almost all of them, however, were only active on the national level. Hardly anyone was fighting disinformation on the local level. 
That is why that is why we set ourselves the goal of starting to train as many German media houses as possible to become fact checkers in the election year 2021. Through the support of Google, we were able to offer the media houses an extensive training program. Since last winter, we have intensively trained more than 100 media houses in the techniques of digital research and verification. It is fascinating to see how journalists from national media, such as Der Spiegel, Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung, or Deutschland Radio, have researched and worked together with colleagues from small newspapers from the Black Forest or the North Sea coast during our workshops. A central lesson from these workshops, verification and fact-checking only succeed in teamwork. Already in March this year, we pointed out the most common fakes in election campaigns to our partners in in-depth training sessions. The spectrum of lies ranged from allegedly manipulated ballot boxes and problems with postal voting to fake election posters or manifold lies about the Green Party candidate for Chancellor, Annalena Baerbock. In the meantime, far more than 600 journalists are registered in our joint Slack workspace for the Faktencheck 21 project. In recent months, we have repeatedly presented exemplary fact checks from rural or local regions. In quite a lot of cities, local media companies had announced after attending our training sessions that they would regularly publish regional fact checks during the election campaign. We at DPA are very happy that media houses like the Neue Osnabrücker Zeitung, Mainpost in the city of Würzburg, Augsburger Allgemeine, Sächsische Zeitung, Rheinpfalz, Lausitzer Rundschau and many others have published fact checks. In the last days before the federal election, we warned the project participants about the current election campaign fakes. And here are some headlines from fact, checked, from fact checks published by the regional media the past few days. First headline, is the head of the polling station allowed to throw mask refusers out of the polling station? The answer is yes, if the mask refuses endanger others while voting. Or another fact check, will election observers be locked up during the count? Answer is no. Is my ballot only valid if I sign it? No, on the contrary, it is invalid with signature. And the last one, are unvaccinated people allowed to vote? Yes, of course they are, but they have to wear a face mask. Um, with the help of Google's custom search engine, I can see every day now whether the media houses have published new fact checks. The result is, at least at the moment, highly encouraging. The number of fact checkers is many times higher than a year ago when we started our project. Does this have something to do with our project? I think so. <laughs> at least we see in the vast majority of cases that the new fact checkers work for media houses that have participated in our training. We made an interesting observation. Skepticism about the fact check format is greatest at the management levels of media companies. This is perhaps also related to the difficult situation, especially of the newspaper companies in Germany. There are so many problems at the moment that there is little time for developing new formats like the fact check. However, we have seen in many, many media houses all over Germany that very young journalists in particular, usually under 30, are pushing the idea of the fact check. The young people, often still trainees, know how important the exchange of opinions in social networks is and how widespread disinformation is there. To be quite honest, it was a long and very time consuming process to convince the media houses of the new fact-checking format. And I don't know if the interest in fact-checking will continue now after the elections. But we have achieved an important milestone. The federal elections took place on September the 27th without any significant disinformation or fakes. Or to put it in another way, there were, of course, a lot of lies in the social networks. But in the vast majority of cases, these lies and disinformation did not spread in any way worth mentioning. This is certainly also due 
to the work of fact checkers in Germany. Unfortunately, I have to mention one more thing, and it concerns the city in which I enjoy living for more than 10 years. In our capital, Berlin, there have been an alarming number of organizational problems at polling stations during the federal elections and the regional elections that took place at the same time. These problems were real. I am curious to see whether and how these official errors will be misused for disinformation campaigns. And that will be another challenge for the growing number of fact checkers in Germany. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions in the Q&A. Joining me now in the studio is Director of Trust and Safety at Google, Amanda Story. Amanda, welcome. Thank you. What is Google doing to fight misinformation? Yeah, we take our responsibility around misinformation really seriously and we, we work to fight misinformation in three main ways. The first is we have a set of what we call our information quality levers, raise, reduce, remove and reward. So just to explain a little bit about what those are. Um, RAISE is about raising up authoritative voices. So, for example, making sure information panels from authoritative entities like health authorities around the world are being raised up to give users really um, trusted information. The second is REDUCE. So we make sure that if con content is borderline, that we're not actually recommending it to users. They have to be actively seeking it to find it. The third is remove. So we have extensive machine learning and trained human reviewers around the world to make sure that we're removing content that violates our policies or violates local laws. And finally, our reward lever. So this is about making sure that only content that is of the highest quality actually monetizes. Um, and that's a really important one. And we make sure we're enforcing that really rigorously. So that's information quality. The second area is around user education and transparency. So in the user transparency space, we have functionality like about this result. It's a few little dots next to a search result and you can click on it and actually see information about the result, about the site, um, about the security of the site, who's behind the site. And that's really important to give users that ambient information as they're searching to understand the quality of the information they're seeing. And then on user education, we have programs like Be Internet Legends, which is a great program targeted at school age kids to help them understand online information, online safety, and really navigate the web smoothly. And then the third and final area that's really critical is collaboration. And that's why it's so exciting to be here today. Um, but we've actually been collaborating in the misinfo space for a really long time, even back as far as 2015, when misinformation was still a relatively new conversation. Uh, we, through the Google News Initiative, uh, worked on something called the First Draft Coalition. So it was a collaboration between eight news and technology partners to really try and combat misinformation. And more recently, we've launched things like the Google Safety Engineering Center in Dublin as a place to bring together experts in really challenging spaces like this and to debate and to co-create to make sure we're addressing these sorts of challenges. What do you see as the major threats in this space? Yeah, so, I mean, even before the web, bad actors always tried to manipulate information for, for gain or for nefarious intent. And society and individuals have always had to wrestle with what is fact and what is fiction. Um, but I think the difference today is, is three main things. Firstly, the speed of content creation has just exploded. Secondly, the speed of the propagation of that information around the world, around the web. And the third is about provenance. How do you actually identify where the information came from? So we think about each of those in turn and try and make sure we're being really thoughtful about um, the way that we address those issues. In terms of speed of creation, we're really trying to keep pace with what we see as the emerging threats online. So we do that evolving our policies. For example, during COVID, we saw some harmful health claims emerging online, sort of fake cures, uh, fake ways to prevent COVID. And we evolved our policies to try and keep pace with that harmful health misinfo trend. Um, we also have Intel teams who are looking constantly at what are the new emerging threats online and making sure that we are detecting in an effective way given that Intel. Uh, so again, to get, use a COVID example, um, we were seeing misinfo trends in certain countries. We translated those into all of the languages in the world so we could screen for the same misinfo appearing elsewhere and try to get ahead of that. And we have technology teams who are looking at state-backed disinformation as well. So our threat analysis group is tracking 270 state-backed actors um, on a real-time basis to make sure we understand the information they're trying to propagate and that we're addressing that. And we provide transparency about that through our threat analysis group bulletin on a, on a monthly basis. So that's kind of how do you deal with the speed of the creation. In terms of speed of propagation, 
It's a really tricky one because actually there's a lot of benefit to information flowing very quickly and freely around the world. But um, what we are trying to do is give users an indication if something's moving incredibly quickly. So we have, for example, within search, a notice that comes up to say it looks like these results are changing quickly, just as a flag to the user to understand they might want to treat that information with a bit more caution. And then in terms of provenance, we have some, um, some really interesting ways that we're trying to make sure users have transparency about where um, an entity comes from, where a piece of information comes from. So with our advertisers, for example, we actually check the identity of advertisers through our identity verification uh, programs. We provide information to the user. If they click next to the ad, they can see who the company is, which country they're from. Um, and actually, just very recently, we launched something where a user can see all of the ads that an advertiser has, has uh, run in the last 30 days. So really trying to provide that user transparency so they can make an educated decision about the information they're consuming. Um, but I think really you know, the heart of Google's mission is about organizing the world's information, making it universally accessible and useful. So we have to make sure we keep countering these threats. We have to make sure we're keeping pace and ideally keeping ahead of this. And I think we're, we're looking forward to continuing to collaborate across the industry and with, with many to, to solve this issue. What should ecosystem stakeholders be doing to tackle this challenge? Yeah, so um, there are lots of different players in this ecosystem who, who play a role here. I think in terms of the industry, strong and sustained collaboration is really critical. And uh, the Media and Information Fund is a great example of that. And I'm really excited about what that, that will do. Um, but there's also an opportunity for the industry to share tools and share data sets. Um, so, for example, in 2019, uh, Google AI and Jigsaw launched a data set around deep fakes. Um, and it was a visual data set to allow researchers to identify better ways to detect deep fakes. And actually, you don't hear as much about deep fakes these days. Tools like that, sharing data like that, can really have an impact and help the industry to get ahead. I think there's also a really important role for policymakers. So, when you look at um, the, the kind of policymaker environment, providing greater clarity on how to wrestle with really tough questions like freedom of expression. How do you balance kind of individual responsibility versus sort of the collective? Um, how do you think about providing really meaningful transparency to a regulator, for example? And we're trying to help there in, in all sorts of ways. So one of them is the Digital Trust and Safety Partnership that we've launched. It's an effort to create standards, a little bit like ISO standards in the security space, but for actually auditing content moderation. And that sort of effort, I think, is really important to try and bring a bit more transparency to, to what companies like ours are doing. And then I think there's a kind of larger legal framework here. So there's some really tricky tensions we see between content moderation and privacy, for example, or content moderation and competition considerations or security considerations. So I think there's a role for everyone to play to come together to figure out the right frameworks, the right partnerships, the right sort of collaboration to, to address this issue. So Amanda, who should determine what misinformation is? Yeah, this is really tricky. There's no single agreed source of truth on uh, what is misinformation and what is true information. Um, I think, again, there are kind of different players who have an important role here. I think in terms of the government um, determining kind of what's illegal, consistent with human rights, consistent with democratic processes, um, you know, anchoring on really protecting citizens from harm uh, is, is obviously really important. Um, from, from a company perspective, companies definitely have a responsibility to keep users safe uh, while they're on their platforms. And so uh, we, we put in place policies and enforcement mechanisms to make sure we're, we're keeping our users safe. Um, but we also have to balance consumer choice. If a user is looking to find something, how do we make sure they have free choice to, to find that information? And then there's the role of fact checks and newsrooms. Um, and you know, the free press plays such an important role in holding people to account and uncovering falsehoods. So I think all, um, all of those players have, have a role to play in determining what is misinformation. I think we continue to have a very optimistic view of um, access to high quality information and the value that can provide to society. You know, our mission as a company is organizing the world's information, making it universally accessible and useful. So we really think that um, that information quality is critical and tackling misinformation is a core part of getting that right. Google's advertising products are widely used by websites. So how do you ensure that fake news or misinformation sites aren't profiting from your technology? Yeah, we set a really high bar for what can monetize and what can't. And um, the health and sustainability of the ads ecosystem is really critical to our, our business. Um, users have to uh, trust the quality of the information, the ads they're seeing, 
publishers have to be sure that the ads that show up on their sites are appropriate for their audiences and advertisers have to be sure the context in which their ads appear is brand safe for, for their brand. Um, so we, we work to detect misinformation, detect the quality of a site at scale and we have policies and we enforce against those. Um, and really those policies uh, are in kind of three main areas, uh, the actor level, the behavioural level and the content level. Um, so in terms of content policies, we're looking for signs that a site is um, uh, adhering to our policies, that it's not, for example, putting out dangerous or derogatory information um, to make sure that uh, the actual content of the site itself meets the, the bar that we set. And also that the user-generated content, like comments that might appear on that site, are also meeting certain policy bars. In terms of behavioural um, uh, policies, we're looking at patterns. We're looking at, for example, is this site uh, coordinating in some way with another site that might be nefarious? Um, are they misrepresenting who they are? Are they trying to impersonate another site? And so that's a set of policies that really allow us to um, target sites at the behavioural level. And finally, at the actor level. So we're looking at who is this site actually? Um, have we verified them? Um, are they misrepresenting who they are? And we have policies at that level to take action, not just on the pages and the content appearing on those pages, but to really go upstream and take, take action at the, the site level itself if we see persistent violations. So that combination of actor behavior and content is really critical to maintaining um, a trusted ecosystem of publishers who advertisers can be confident serving ads against. Um, and really it's that combination of approaches that we think is critical to maintaining user trust, maintaining the, the viability, the health, the sustainability of the ads ecosystem. Um, and, uh, and really striking also the, the sort of commercial incentives of uh, running a misinformation campaign. Amanda, thank you very much. Thank you. L'information uh, doit être déformée. Tout le monde publier une rumeur ou uh, faire une erreur dans une publication. On a besoin de protéger nos enfants à la fin qu'ils se protègent et qu'ils développent un esprit critique. Alors je m'appelle Mélanie Jalan, je suis en charge du marketing et du digital chez Playback Press. C'est important pour moi de faire attention aux mauvaises informations pour mes enfants parce que on est dans un monde aujourd'hui qui va de plus en plus vite où l'accès à tout est possible. Et donc, c'est pour ça qu'on a développé des outils qui permettent aux enfants, en se connectant, d'accéder à de la vraie information. Donc 100% fait, 0% opinion. Aussi au programme, une matière qui est l'éducation aux médias. Et en mois de mars, chaque année, il y a la semaine de la presse à l'école. Donc c'est vrai, c'est des choses que les enseignants travaillent beaucoup. C'est quoi l'éducation aux médias Est-ce que c'est normal que le journal se soit présenté de cette façon Dans ce, ce cadre-là et dans notre mission d'éduquer les enfants et se protéger contre les, les fake news, on a mis en place des ateliers de petits journalistes. Euh, Est-ce qu'on a le droit de prendre des photos qu'on trouve comme ça au hasard sur Internet mmh. Pourquoi Ouais. Parce qu'elle peut être fausse. Très bien, exactement. Vraiment euh, une conviction que euh, l'éducation aux médias est importante. Et donc, c'est vraiment un, un, un métier passionnant de, de pouvoir euh, enseigner aux enfants euh, euh, l'actualité simplement, le vocabulaire. Euh, et on se sent vraiment euh, utile. So now it's time for our Q&A session with our guests. Stefan Voss from DPA in Berlin, from Dublin, Colin Golding, Director of Safety and Trust at YouTube, and co-founder and head of Maldita.es, Clara Jimenez-Cruz, joining us from Madrid. It's great to see you all. Thank you for joining us this morning. We have been inundated with questions, so let's go straight to the first one. Earlier, we heard from Alexander Stubb, who stressed that tackling misinformation is a multi-stakeholder endeavour with the public and private sector coming together. Now, you've all stated the importance of collaboration. So what can you teach others about how to do this effectively and with the most impact? Clara. Well, first of all, as I said in my presentation, everyone talks about collaborating against misinformation, but we need to actually do meaningful collaboration. I know fact checkers collaborate among themselves and with platforms that show interest in using their word, 
but I think we need to go further ahead. We dedicate a lot of time in thinking how we can address collaboration with platforms and how that can become meaningful collaboration and not just collaboration at specific points. And I think we need to work further on that. This is a problem that evolves on a daily basis and we actually need to address it on a daily basis and not only on specific occasions like a pandemic or an election process. Stefan? Yeah, we, what we have seen is, um, especially talking about fact checks so far, we are only looking at the national level generally of fact checkers. So uh, what we suggest is uh, that we should have more an eye on, on regional and local fact checking, which is very important apart from that. And another aspect, as it had, had been mentioned before, is media literacy, um, media competence, um, mentioned by uh, by almost everyone here in this uh, conference. So what we see is, is we have seen a lot of uh, uh, projects for the youth uh, from Emily and the project from France we just heard about. But let's not forget about the older people as well in this in this context means like readers of newspapers and they, and they should be trained. So it should be a broader understanding of that. And my dream would be that, for example, I can see that in Germany, that in the newspapers in Germany would then do media literacy trainings of their readers and we could help them in that project. Uh and Colin, your thoughts on the importance of collaboration and how to do it effectively? I fully agree uh, that we can all learn from each other in this space. Um, and let me just use two examples from across the four hours of our responsibility framework. Um, on removals, we know YouTube reflects the world around us and we can also help shape it. And that's why spreading the, re reducing the spread of misinformation is one of our deepest commitments. And we've been removing content uh, since the start of YouTube under our community guidelines where our policies are focused on videos that directly lead to egregious real-world harm. And we remove almost 10 million a quarter uh, in our transparency report, uh, which don't even reach 10 views. Um, in the coronavirus pandemic, we've removed almost a million videos on coronavirus misinformation, like false cures or claims of a hoax. And we think speedy removals are always going to be important and a part of our toolkit um, but we know they're not nearly enough and how we treat the content we're leaving up uh, is also an important part and how that should be our best path forward. Uh, we don't do this alone. Uh, during COVID, we relied on uh, health organisations who were tracking the pandemic like the CDC and WHO uh, to help us here. Uh, and then secondly, another example I would look at is in the absence of certainty. Uh, we believe tech companies should not be the ones deciding where the boundaries of misinformation is. During the US election, for example, in the days after the US 2020 presidential election, without an official election certification, we did allow voices across the spectrum to remain up. But our systems raised up trustworthy content to viewers. And we saw in the days after that election that the most watched channels came from reliable sources. And then once we had certainty, when those election results were certified in early December, we began to use our removal mechanisms uh, to remove content with false claims that, that widespread fraud changed the outcome of the election. So fully agreed on collaboration uh, and the importance of collaboration as we move forward here. And the importance of speed. I'm glad you mentioned speed, Colin, uh, because that relates to our next question. We know that information travels faster than it ever has done and misinformation is getting more complex. Are we sure there's even time and space to collaborate in this kind of environment? Colin, your, your answer first. Yeah, from our day-to-day -day work, we do see this speed and this complexity increasing. Um, and many times we see this discussion go straight to, we just need to remove more and remove it faster. And this is why we think the solution might not be uh, as obvious as this, um, requires deeper and broader collaboration. Uh, we do think an overly aggressive approach to removals during periods of fast-moving change would have a chilling effect on free speech and can send a message that controversial ideas are unacceptable. I think the most important thing we can do together uh, is continue to work systematically to increase the good and reduce the bad. Um, at YouTube, we're raising up information from trusted sources, reducing the spread of videos with, with harmful misinformation, and we need a clear set of facts. You know, when people search for news or information, they now get results optimized for quality. And for COVID, we relied on the CDC and WHO to track that science as it develops. So in most other cases, misinformation is less clear cut and I think this is where collaboration will be key to get this right in a fast-moving and complex space. Clara, your response? Yes, I think we're talking a lot about reducing content or, or removing content from platforms. And I think that's kind of an issue. I believe 
and the academic research we've seen so far shows that giving context to users it's, is better than to remove it. Also, because removing content creates a feeling within users that um, they're not allowed to say certain things, that there's no freedom of speech on platforms and that platforms are actually being allowed to decide what can and can't be said. And that it's getting very problematic and it's, and it's polarizing societies a lot. I think we need to focus more on giving context around things than just removing. And more on that, we talk a lot and, and platforms tend to talk a lot about these transparency reports where they say that they've removed 10,000 videos in a month. In reality, that gives us no data. We don't know what has been removed and what hasn't. If you ask any fact checker around the world about content on YouTube that hasn't been removed, even though it's harmful, they can show you hundreds of examples. We have one case here in Spain that is very paradigmatic because it started at, around a group of uh, doctors that said that COVID didn't exist. It's actually a, a movement that started in Germany. It came to Spain, it gained a lot of track in Spain and then went to South America. And those videos have been on YouTube platform ever since. They have not been removed and that movement has grown because of that. So I really think we need to address this in a different way, not just saying, yes, we remove a lot of videos. It's a much bigger problem. And it also goes right in line with what we consider should be a democratic decision and what isn't. Yeah, Colin, can I get you to respond to some of those specific points uh, before, before I get your thoughts, Stefan? Yeah, I think uh, working and collaborating with both trusted flaggers and also our fact checkers across Europe is important to flag this uh, information to us. We will continue to, to work on our transparency reports, continue uh, to push transparency across our full operation. Recently, we released our violent review rate. Uh, so this is the North Star metric that we've been using uh, within our operations to ensure that we're uh, targeting the right information for our removals. But I fully agree with the point that it's not just removals. Uh, it's also the other elements that are important as we add context to information uh, as users are seeking, seeking that information today. Stefan. I, I just wanted to add as uh, what uh, what Clara said. We uh, both as Maldita and Deutsche Presseagentur as experienced fact checkers, we have heard a lot about deplatforming, especially in Germany, for example, the last month, uh, a lot of like bad actors have been expelled. That might be helpful for a platform like YouTube. And there might be reasons to do that, of course. But on the other hand, the, for society, I don't know how helpful this is, because these actors are only moving to another platform. What is needed really to counter these wrong information, this false information with uh, third party facts with fact checks? And to be absolutely honest, this is for me is lacking on YouTube still. So um, uh, Clara has, uh, has, has uh, told with whom they are cooperating, we do as well, that's Facebook, that's WhatsApp, and even TikTok has started cooperating with fact checkers directly. And as we see, it's still, it's still something lacking, and especially YouTube videos with false information are hard to, uh, to verify, very hard, because like in a three minutes video, you have, let's say, a dozen of claims. And so it's a lot of work. And I, I guess this is, would be a lot more effective just to, to counter and to fight uh, disinformation in this case. Uh, the next question's come in from Millie Bozier. I notice all the battle language around fighting, combating, etc. I wonder what we can learn from the failures of the war on drugs and war on terror. Do we need a war on misinformation or is a more uh, systemic and empathetic approach possible? Stefan. Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good question. Uh, definitely. Um, let's say, for example, we we fact checkers, we are not fighting. Uh, we are not expelling anyone. Uh, we are just checking things. We take people serious. We take their claim. We have a look at them. And then we do with diligence and accuracy are just checking it and give an answer to that. So this is, from my point of view, that's totally different from, from fighting or deleting something. This is about, once again, about facts and convincing people and taking them for serious. So, yeah, the question is right. We, we should keep that in mind. Uh, that's a lot more than deleting content in that discussion. Uh, Clara, is that language problematic and do we need a more <laughs> empathetic approach? 
Um, it is not problematic to me, and there's a reason for that kind of language, especially trying to gather citizens to work together with us in that battle. I think that's why we use that kind of language. I do understand that when we talk about specific groups that are extremely convinced about misinformation, let's say anti-vaccine groups, there we need to use a different kind of language and be more empathic. But when we're talking about misinformation to the general public, I think the battle language is right. Colin, do you agree? I agree it's a societal approach. Um, I agree with both with Clara and Stefan here. And this is going to take all of us um, to get this right. So everywhere from this morning, we've heard from media literacy through to the responsibility of the platforms and the, the four R's, not just removal, but also reward and raise and reduce. Um, so fully aligned that this is a collaborative effort that we're all going to need to, to work towards. Uh, Millie, thank you for your question. Great question. Um, thank you for all your questions that are coming in. Uh, please do keep them coming. Uh, the next one is from Mark Epstein. Populists describe journalists and the mainstream media generally as remote, unsympathetic and part of the problem, along with liberal politicians. To be better heard and taken more seriously, shouldn't we encourage, uh, concentrate, I should say, on encouraging greater social and ethnic diversity among journalists themselves? Clara. I totally agree with that assessment. I truly believe in diversity in newsrooms because we need to be as diverse as the world we're trying to talk about. And if you come to Maldita's newsroom, for example, there's people from all social perspectives, from different countries, from different skin colors. I think diversity is needed in order to be able to address those kinds of problems. Furthermore, I think that collaborating with institutions and organizations that address um, diverse publics will also help us understand better which kind of disinformation is uh, hitting or, or um, affecting those kinds of groups to be able to better uh, fact check that information. And also when talking about media literacy campaigns, to be able to design specific media literacy campaigns to those groups that might be consuming disinformation and might be very diverse from what we might perceive as media literacy needed. Stefan, you're a, you're a journalist. How do we improve diversity? Uh, how would we improve by, by having like <laughs> diverse people in our, in our editorial team? Of course, that's what we try to do. But uh, on the other hand, I agree with uh, what Clara said, but um, for a fact checker is mainly, most it's not that important where you come from. The most important, once again, how you work, how you're doing your work. But I agree with you. And for example, at, at DPA, we are still on the way. We, we are not where we want to be. It is absolutely necessary to understand situations, to, 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 uh, to, 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 to get the right attitude and the right facts on, on things. So that's a long way to go. But once again, the uh, most important thing for fact checkers is uh, accuracy and diligence. That's the most important thing for us to do um, because it's a, quite an objective. It's like a journalistic assessment what we do in our project. But I, I agree with that. We have to get, become more diverse and reflect how society in Germany, for example, is. Yeah, and to ta taking on board your uh, point, it, it may not matter as much when it comes to fact check as where you come from, but we, we all have biases, myself included. Sure. Um, Colin. Sure. So on the, the Google and YouTube side here, um, we've continued our Google News Initiative Fellowship Program this summer, which brought uh, 30 journalists, uh, young journalists, into fellowships across newsrooms across Europe. Um, one of these journalists has come out from Afghanistan, is currently a refugee in Switzerland. And we've seen huge demand for this program. So the diversity of thought and ideas, new thought and new ideas coming into newsrooms with almost 20,000 applicants for this program this year from which we selected 30. So our contribution to, to this diversity is through that Google News Initiative Fellowship program. Next question from Declan. Uh, what about Generation Z, the younger cohort whose digital street corner is TikTok with its micro clips? Many of them rely on peer influencers rather than traditional media sources. How do we reach out to them? Can journalism fact checking training be repurposed for influencers, perhaps? Clara. Well, there are different ways of approaching that. One of the things uh, some fact checkers are already doing is trying to work with influencers to explain to them uh, how they have to drive their content to be fact-based or even engage with them in fact checking itself. Other things that fact checkers are doing around the world is trying to engage with the said generation 
through their own platforms. And that means that we have to go out of Facebook and Twitter where we are probably more comfortable in working and start doing Twitch programs and TikToks and those kinds of things. One of the things that we found that is very useful for that is bringing very young people into the newsrooms that are actually like their social media platform might be TikTok or Twitch and trying to engage with them in, in creating fact checking for those spaces. Anyways, there is a need in these new platforms to address the way in which they decide how they're going to run their policies on fact checking. As far as we know, for example, on Twitch, where there's a lot of misinformation around science, there's no policy for misinformation. TikTok does have a policy around misinformation, but it's still one that only goes to erase uh, misinformation content and still not give context to the users on the platform. So those are the kind of things new platforms need to start thinking about. And maybe even the older platforms might learn from what they discover or what, or what they innovate about them. Colin, your thoughts on reaching out to younger people? Yeah, I, I'd agree with Clara's thoughts here. Um, the, this continues to move fast. The, um, the content and the creative elements continue to move fast. Um, we work with our creators uh, day to day to ensure our creators as well are also um, able to support the, the 4 r responsibility framework that we use on a day to day basis and raise those voices um, and make sure that the, the voices are being heard uh, for the most authoritative sources. Um, okay, uh, this question is from Jonathan Heward. I agree with Rasmus that quality journalism is an effective defence against information disorder, but I'd love to know how this works. What is it about journalism that equips audiences to navigate the information environment? If we knew the answer to this question, we could focus our resources. Uh, Stefan, I'll get you to attempt to answer this question first. That's that's a good question. What I see in like uh, traditional journalism, in a way that um, like uh, colleagues are mainly concentrated of the 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 actors, like like politicians or officials and so on, and just doing their work. What we see is lacking in journalism is doing monitoring to understand that apart from what is officially like published or told and can be reported on uh, as I'm I'm working for for a news agency for over 20 years what I can see that we have these like say second world we have these other sources of information which let's say 95 or 98% of journalists are not following means like facebook groups um uh, youtube channels and also telegram which has gone more and more important so journalists have to have an eye on that should be monitoring what is really bothering people uh, in society. And, and to my uh, view, so for example, let's say all the vaccination questions. One thing are the official figures, for example, in Germany, but the other things are, are just, just maybe fakes that are bothering people. And once again, the absolute majority of journalists does not see this disinformation. So that should be also a, a change within journalism to be more aware of what, is, what are people talking about and what is uh, confusing them. Uh, Colin, uh, Clara, I can see you both nodding there. Uh, Colin, I'll come to you first. Uh, I think you know, agreeing with, with Stefania and, and building on this, I think also ensuring that uh, as we raise authoritative voices across our platform, um, that that information has been seen by all uh, and ensuring that uh, we continue to collaborate and train journalists with the digital tools that Google has developed over the last number of years, uh, something we've done in the run-up to the German election and something we're committed to doing going forward as well. Clara? So one of the things we struggle uh, to explain to, to newspaper directors and legacy media uh, executives is the fact that people are not only reading their media outlets right now. People consume information in many different platforms, in many different ways, from many different sources. And therefore, the explanation of the world that people need nowadays is not the same they needed 10 years ago. That's why if you see right now how fact-checking th fact thrives itself, it has a lot to do with answering to people's queries and to trying to explain the context around general issues that might be on the front newspapers, but that are not explained enough so that people that don't regularly consume news can actually understand it. And that has come one of um, 
the main tasks that fact checkers need to do on a daily basis. And I think that the more and more legacy media uh, start doing that, the more a cleaner information ecosystem we may have. That has come clear with the pandemic. If you see any media outlet around the world, they have been answering people's queries around COVID-19 because that was the news, right? Like what people were asking themselves was what uh, general journalists were needing to report. I think trying to take that into different issues around politics, around environment, around and every other topic we talk about might be helpful on that. Clara, Stefan, Colin, thank you so much for sharing your time and expertise with us. And thank you for all of your questions. It's been a fascinating morning here and to provide some reflections on the day, we are fortunate enough to have Diana Layfield, Google's President of News Partnerships in EMEA with us. Diana, welcome. What have you taken from today's summit? Well, first, I think it's extremely hard to sum up a, a morning as rich as this morning. But uh, and I want to thank all of the participants for a tremendous set of contributions. For me, I think there have been three things that I've taken away from this. The first is the the importance and the consequential nature of the topic that we're talking about. So I thought Alexander Stubbs' quote from Hannah Arendt was incredibly powerful in reminding us about why we should care about this topic and why it's important for the future of our societies. I think the second is just the enormity and the scale of the challenge. The range of actors from state actors to ordinary people who misunderstand topics that we have to tackle uh, in this regard. But the third and probably the most exciting for me is the degree of alignment that there is around how we work together on this problem, making sure that we all collaborate intensely and work together to try and solve this issue. And when I think about the sort of key examples, I think, you know, Stefan Voss and the DPA in Germany bringing together news outlets ahead of big information events like elections to try and make sure there is that authoritative content is hugely exciting. We heard from Vice President Jarova uh, about the European code and the need for a refresh there. And that's something that we at Google are hugely supportive of uh, and want to work with regulators and other experts to ensure we have a modern, workable version of that code. We heard earlier about the new fund. Why did Google decide to contribute to this launch? So we're enormously excited about the impact that this fund can have. This is a European-led initiative which, under the leadership of the European Universities Institute and the Gulbenkian Foundation. And we believe this is something that can be a very, very practical contribution to this problem. We're contributing 25 million to the fund, and we hope and believe that other organizations will follow us in helping to support that type of European media literacy, working with journalists, with experts, and other players across the region. Diana, thank you so much. Once again, please do visit the new website to learn more about the European Media and Information Fund by following the link on the screen. On behalf of the European University Institute, the Kaluskal Benkin Foundation, Google and YouTube, thank you for joining us and for supporting the fight against misinformation online. Goodbye.